so our department we found is uh, okay cool a lot of the 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 talks that we do or the way that we communicate what seems to resonate a lot is the going more virtual with recordings and stuff like that it seems like the way students are actually interacting more is is instead of like you know your traditional way of of teaching with slides and classrooms like doing even even more like this kind of conversation style stuff or video recording dr a does a lot of like going out with his class and he'll like take the drone out and he'll nice. do like all these drone footage which like and i've been using a lot of his footage for some uh, for a restoration oh, that you could because it's like you know you can show a, a photo of of like a, a wetland but then like dr a has all these these uh what's that those twin ponds that are up by you oh yeah 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 huh? and it's wetlands, just like yeah. yeah here's the layers of it and like the drone just goes yeah. and you're like in the wetland it's cool i like it yeah. that was my son piloting that so so welcome everybody to do drop in for this week uh so uh we are in a different setting so super cool we're here in uh, wildwood park in thousand oaks uh next to this big giant waterfall over there and we've just had a fantastic trip with brenton's um restoration ecology class and Nicholas has been giving us a fan, uh, both spoke to um, uh, our class. And if you guys are interested, you could check out that awesome lecture. But also we just had a fantastic plant walk, native plant walk. And, and we're talking about um, all the awesome properties and aspects of our native vegetation, as well as traditional like, ecological knowledge, traditional uses and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so, uh, so Nicholas, welcome. Welcome to the Dew Drop In. The, the, the Dew Drop? The Dew Drop In. So the Dew Drop In is this place in uh, New Orleans that, that physically it still exists, but it's not, it's gone. But basically it was a place where everybody would come and hang out and, and everybody would be there. So it'd be rich people, poor people, black people, gay people, straight people, old people, young people. And so, so we named this thing the Dew Drop because it's like, a, like everybody can come and hang out and just sort of chat kind of thing. So, nice. Um, so, anyway, so so um so give us give us a little history of um so you uh, so tell us about um your career so so you are uh, among among many things you're a native plant expert and you are an expert in terms of propagation in terms of trying to interject more native vegetation and practices and stuff into our society so so give us a give us a quick overview of of what you are working on these days basically it's just education and awareness mm -hmm. I think we look at native plants in the traditional way of gardening and landscaping and things like that. We rarely understand native plants and how they should be in the environment. What we should be focusing and beginning to introduce the different concepts is restoration. Because that's essentially what you do when you're trying to create habitat, especially in suburban mm -hmm. and urban areas. Mm -hmm. That's what allows you to be very successful with planting, especially garden spaces that have native plants, plants that flower all year round. That that provide potential for you know sustaining species, pollinators, birds, etc. It's not reimagining the environment of what we prefer it to be, looking at native plants in homogenous ways that's been extremely detrimental and harmful and and it really creates that sense of home, sense of place, and how our home and the places in which we live or occupy have been so detrimentally affected over the many years that we're living in the aftermath of what seems like normal for us. But when the art, you start to begin to understand what sustainability is, all these factors that are really trendy today, you can only manage or achieve that with native plants, but specifically the local varieties. So a garden, you know, oftentimes can be limiting, but with this type of knowledge and appreciation, begin to connect with the environment, whether it's nearby your house or further away, and have that beauty of the landscape there where it's desperately needed. So I try to do the best I can to take my past experience in the professional world Horticulture, you know, landscape architecture, and um, restoration ecology, working with different agencies, my cultural knowledge, because at the end of the day, there needs to be this human relationship with these specific plants that show us not only what's possible, but what's so desperately needed is to see nature as an extension of ourselves. That's something that can't just be destroyed and replaced and constantly recreated. It creates a real important aspect that's missing for many people. And a connectivity too, a connection to the natural world too. Because California is a huge and beautiful place. And as though there may be similarities with the ecosystems and plants, they're always different in how they grow and how they grow upon one another and things. And I think that leads not with something that's limiting, but endlessly, you know, full of possibilities. Mm -hmm. 
And, and with that, I think it allows us to enjoy when we interact with the natural world more, especially with hiking and camping. Instead of going to a space to have, you know, memories or a certain, you know, recreational value or and when you leave that space, you don't just remove yourself from it. In fact, you see yourself in those spaces and you find yourself surrounded by things that you know in case of an emergency, you know. A lot of these plants are capable of providing us with medicines, even emergency food. But how that expands even more, we talk about organic gardening, sustainability. We're always working against the environment with these practices. When we look around native plants, with over 6,000 plants here, all those plants basically a lot of ways there's direct substitutes for many of the plants we prefer and even oftentimes include exclusively. Toyon is related to, the, to an apple. Elderberry is to, to native California is pretty much the same variety you find in Europe and therefore all the possibilities that you find in the grocery store of those products can be easily made and even kept in your space. Cohoba is a native plant. Additionally, we have a native cherry. The list goes on and on, native grape. Why limit ourselves? Why look at our environment around us with our yard as something to just enjoy for, you know, just greenery or whatever? Why not have an interaction? And in that interaction, you are taken care of, but also the plants are too, and our relationship is ongoing and continues to grow. Yeah, and it's, it's bizarre to me that, that if we take the classic American single family home example, that we tried, every one of the, at least in California historically, in recent decades, everyone's a lawn. And it's like, you know, I get it. If you if you had kids playing football or something, or what, I guess you want a flat lawn. But but short of that, the um, dog needs some some. The some dog needs poop. Some, yeah, yeah, it's easy, easy to clean the poop. I agree, easy to clean the poop. But but short of those things, um, well, what I've noticed in my neighborhood is as those lawns have come out in recent years, primarily because of drought. But but regardless, they come out and people put um, much more engaging and interesting visually, culturally, food, you know, all these other just much more interesting fronts of their houses, places to sit down and talk. And, and it's, it's, it's strange to me that um, in a country that so supposedly prides ourselves on our independence and individualism and stuff, that mostly just people want to clone. I, yeah, make yeah. my house look like that house. And yeah, make yeah. This, yeah. Totally. So are you, seeing, are you seeing increased interest in people, for example, with the drought, putting more um, native landscaping in? Well, definitely the drought in the previous years, as it's as intense as it's been, there's been a real larger conversation and inclusion of native plants, but largely it's in preference for plants that are somehow, you know, drought tolerant. Yeah, zero scaping. Right? Zero scape. Those plants come from other parts of the world and even contribute to our growing invasive plant problem. It largely is inadequate in its response because, you know, a lot of people do what was popular in places like LA with the, I call them the aquarium gardens just the zero scape of the rocks and all the right, succulents right, right, and right, right, right. how that contributes to even more like heat island effect and how when we talked about on our hike today that cactuses as prominent as there are in this space isn't like you know that way in most of california the six thousand plants less than five percent are actually cactus or cacti so we're limited we're very limited in that capacity and, and pretty much 98 percent of all cactuses that are native california are found truly in the deserts the Mojave, the Sonoran of Colorado, and only when you get past, you know, the, the coastal range mountains into the coastal areas, you have at most five, six species of cactus, mm -hmm. and they're only found from Santa Barbara County into northern Baja. And so we look at our environment trying to achieve, you know, drought tolerance and stuff in ways that are really largely ignoring the possibility of green evergreen spaces yeah. that are flowering consistently all year round right pollinators and, everything support mm -hmm. yeah. and in having this inclination and also understanding of what seasons are in california we always look at our environment consistently through ignorance because of the state that it currently is in we consistently see it in the aftermath of not only colonization but ongoing biological destruction and so to be able to really change people's minds is they need really great examples. And those are few and far between because very few landscapers, gardeners, etc., are willing to get into the details and, and basic principles of restoration or knowledge of our environment. To have a yard that looks great two parts of the year, fall and spring, is very <laughs> limiting. The potential is endless in, in summer. You have a lot of plants that are flowering and doing yep. great in summer. In fact, you can have a habitat you need different plants at different intervals, performing and at different levels, mm -hmm. flowering, going to seed, green, 
And that's what keeps life going year round. Mm -hmm. Migratory birds, local birds, pollinators. You start to see these these very important life forms that are struggling to survive in our urban suburban interfaces because we're not planting the plants that they directly need. Yep. And we think somehow that's gonna save them. What's gonna save them is giving them what they need, which largely gets, you know, ignored are these plant species that are, you know, in our local hillside and mm -hmm. areas and maybe you reintroducing plants that should have originally been there but have largely been extirpated. And you're also talking about also in terms of conceptualizing your home or your space in, in that way, mm -hmm. there's also the idea of fire management. And you, and you were mentioning that one of the, the ideas you could think about is to, is to also think of vegetation as, as ember catchers, sort of like a, like, a, like a net before it gets to your house or your eaves or your whatever. Yeah, that's really important. You know, like I said, we talk about the environment and we relate to it in complete ignorance. And then we also, in our ignorance, demonize the very things that are contributing to a healthy environment. It's not something that's inseparable, and that is fire. Sure, today, fire, as it continues to be destructive, was created to be this way. Mm -hmm. It never has existed in this form for thousands of years until fairly recently due to fire suppression, mm -hmm. fire mismanagement, mm -hmm. and of course, the ethics of what are considered conservation to treat nature like a museum you mm -hmm. don't interact with it therefore Pe people you, are away from it yeah you don't mm -hmm. you don't understand the environment what it needs and so therefore it builds up fuels ladder fuels etc but today to think that as far as an evil to somehow try to eliminate or prevent it from a, you know harming you or anything around you is largely this is keeping things at a distance. Yeah, fuels management. It's, yeah. it's always talked about as fuels management. Keeping things at a distance, and there's this no man's land in between where invasive species thrive. And species, invasive species are largely responsible for how wildfires continue to develop and be present on the landscape annually rather than every decade or so. Mm -hmm. And they alter our environment for the worse. Thinking about all these invasive species, the majority of them are annuals. They perform certain parts of the year, and then the rest of the year they continue to occupy space without securing water resources, soil management, or even giving us the basics of healthy air. Mm -hmm. And then these plants continue to thrive, and in the absence of natives, it's really hard for natives, if any at all, are able to reclaim that space. So today, the options are to continue upon things that have not really worked out, because as each year as you go forward, it keeps getting worse. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is not working. Right. So solutions are not trying to recreate some new and innovative way of trying to combat this problem, how about we look for tens of thousands of years how indigenous peoples lived in this landscape and it was consistent and how that consistency is something we so desperately need today especially with trying to curb the issues in which are becoming much more exacerbated every single year so indigenous cultures are not cultures that somehow reach some climax and then decline like many civilizations around the world still here still here but the important thing is is the reason why we have the giant sequoias the redwood trees, the longest living species of trees on earth, like the foxtail pine, the bristlecone pine, is because the ongoing ingenuity and innovation of indigenous cultures. When colonization came, that was our decline, and subsequently led into the decline of our environment as a whole. That's why in the first round of our change climate, we're losing sequoias to, a, to, a, 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 to, to fire, which normally was key to the Which is crazy survival. just to think about. It. Like, yeah, yeah, it's totally changed. Yeah. And so with our houses, with our homes, with the gardens, any opportunity we have with interacting with the environment, it's an opportunity. And that opportunity is to begin to try to restore a natural balance. And it takes getting beyond that ignorant stage, mm -hmm. getting deep into what the complexities of everything is. Because let's tell you, let's, let's put it out there. Simpl simplification of everything has really done a lot of damage. You cannot simplify anything, especially our environment. And so when we have those open spaces in no man's land where the invasive species consistently are present and thrive, we lose a huge opportunity for habitat that's mm -hmm. crucial, mm -hmm. but also an effective fire barrier. Mm -hmm. On our walk today, we saw tons of plants. A lot of these plants are dormant, some are dormant. Those do well with regular fire, but low intensity fires. What keeps those fires from becoming intense, negative, you know, in their, in their current state as they are today, is a presence of plants that are longer lived, but they also take a long time to grow. Mm -hmm. But they're largely fire resistant. So when a fire comes up, they resist the fire by not actually burning, but melting. And they come back really quickly and they're very successful with toning down the intensity of fire. Even managing it and allowing it to move a little bit 
more because when you think of something that's a barrier it breaks that intensity and it tends to go around and it builds mm -hmm. intensity and it goes around is that forward but slowing mm -hmm. but natural motion that happens so what are those plants so cactus so prickly sugar pear, bush yeah prickly pear cactus lemonade berry quail bush yuccas and then you know toyon coastline oak all these plants that are evergreen especially in the summer are really important plants to really appreciate and how they also are really effective in fire management, but also keeping fire at a healthy interval. So having those around your house also is important in being an effective fire barrier, but as fire continues to build up even miles away, the possibility of embers continuously, you're flying through the air, igniting fires, burning houses from the inside rather than the outside. There's nothing there. Exactly to, mostly happen. Yep, and if there's nothing there to capture them and extinguish them, your house is not protected at all unless you have a really great fire department or a really great fire response which tends to cost tens of millions if not billions of dollars annually so native plants especially those fire resistant plants are able to catch those embers they fall to the bottom of their canopies and they get extinguished disallowing the fire to continue to spread gain intensity and become unmanageable for those who are trying to protect life and property. And so like I remember when I was at your house last time, you were saying that Cal Fire or, or the, maybe the local fire department mm -hmm. came out and told you to clear out a lot mm -hmm. of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So are they encouraging, mm -hmm. encouraging you to plant some of these plants no. or are they just saying no. clear everything no, they, out? They want a dead, they want a, like a, a soil, bare soil landscape basically. Oh. So I, I, I cleared mm -hmm. a lot of it because they were going to come on my property and do it anyway and give me an $8,000 bill. They were going to give me an $8,000 bill for doing it. Oh, wow. And so, so I, 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 I did a lot of clearing. Uh, I'll just say I didn't clear everything. <laughs> but, I, but I definitely, uh, you know, uh, got things better. Is um, it mostly dead debris or stuff yeah. that's dormant? Or like, so if you had, mostly say, prickly... Mostly dead, but I like the dead. I mean, the dead stuff's habitat for oh, totally. all kinds of stuff. But, but, but it was, it, most of the stuff we pulled out, pulled out two tons of stuff. Jeez. off my hillside um and it was mostly dead some of it was more senescing some of it i just sort of cut back i didn't didn't cut the tree down but i just sort of trimmed it they also want you to limb up stuff so i so i i you know cut off some low lower branches um because they're worried about sort of ground fire getting mm -hmm. and then jumping up kind of deal um but uh but yeah i mean i think i think you know obviously there's this whole conversation I totally get why we want to have these these barriers right so to, to help the, the Help deal with the fire front when it's coming in but but once we clear that area then the invasive grasses and stuff yep. come in and then it makes it worse so we did so we actually followed up on this experiment in at UCLA I did my PhD at UCLA uh, so my friends uh, John Labrinos Tom Huggins and, and some other folks we um, there was an experiment on the campus of UCLA in the 60s to deal with fire and the idea was these professors said oh my god this California landscape burns that sucks we don't like fire let's get rid of it so they went and they they t and this was still when UCLA was relatively small, so there were areas on campus where there weren't a build, wasn't concrete or anything. And so they went, and they, they took an area and they, they nuked it. They, they literally bulldozed it. They, they, they took down all the native scrub, coastal sage scrub vegetation basically in Chaparral, took it down. And then they introduced what they thought were less flammable plants. So they, they planted various species. And then they monitored it for a couple of years and so and then they like like us oh, boring we're gonna do something else they left it so we actually found it in the <laughs> 1990s again this was started in the 60s so we found it in the 1990s and we said oh we should so we kind of did our best to basically relocate where it was and we resurveyed it and long story short um, the places that they disturbed actually were worse for fire so they thought that by knocking down these these native species that burn that have some oils in them that burn or whatever that we're gonna be helping the situation. Instead, they actually made it much more likely to burn and much more, um, much harder for the natives to come back in. And so, so it's kind of like a, a, a directed example of a, of a landscape effort that was specifically designed to help and completely did, uh, just made things worse. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, good times, good times. So, okay, so, 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 so all that happy talk, all that happy talk yeah, yeah. Is, is all good. Tell us, tell, us a, tell us a fun story, you're telling us you're telling us some different stories about where some of our, we don't have many common names for our California uh, native plants that have a traditional uh, native origins, but we do have some. 
Yeah. So, so you, you want to give us a couple of those, one or two of those? Yeah, there's only a handful of plants that really have native names. or known by indigenous word. You know, Tehuillon is one. Mm -hmm. you know, it's an Ohlone word, which originates from the San Francisco Bay Area. Then you have uh, Mitsilaha, Mitsilaha poppy, which is, you know, a local plant that many people know. And that's a Shumash word. So it's really interesting how very few native plants are still known commonly by, the name. by its traditional indigenous name. But you know, there are still some place names that remain on the landscape, you know, places that can seem like a root, like Simi Valley, like what in, the, what in the world does that mean? Shiami, sun shines brightly, Kahuenga, Topanga, Tohunga, all these places are still original place names of which, you know, were referred to and known by indigenous peoples. What's interesting is, yeah, today we're so infatuated with you know separating things so borders or one international yeah. borders yeah. neighborhoods redlining things like that and how it's either the haves or the have-nots and that belief between you stay over there this is my space but that's not something that is present in our in our environment especially with plant communities i was talking about this last night in the class with oak woodlands and grasslands there was never any definitive factor that kept them separated. They gave way to one another right. and they constantly right. did this dance with fire and other things that were factors. And, and that's why I like to talk about Topanga, as it's always say, Panga, but it's <laughs> Topanga, you know. It's actually two words in one, two different languages in one. So you have Shumash, which is Topa, which means mountain. Mm -hmm. And Ga is Tongfa for of the place. So mountain place is essentially what that translates into. These confluences with different cultures would always meet. Tongva, Shumash, Taviyam. Usually saw a blending and an enhancement of all these cultures into this influence where it had unique basketry, unique words. Mm -hmm. It was a beauty in which human civilization or culture just took on a whole new other form. Rather than this is mine, this is yours, you stay there, you stay there, but we, these divisive politics that we have today. And how that's also part of nature too. How they complement each other and they take on this unique way and how beautiful that is. Because it's not only different, but it's something familiar. And it's not only familiar, but it's beautiful. It's like a cultural mixtape. Yeah. Like a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I have this influence yeah. and then I have my own... It's not taking from anybody. It's not keeping anybody at a, at a distance. It's actually seeing where's our common ground? Where's our commonality? Where is something that we have to, to contribute to one another? And that's where humanity flourishes. Mm -hmm. Not only humanity, but the environment too. Because then knowledge is built even more. Oh, we use plants for this way. We use plants for that way. Well, I never thought of that. And cultural knowledge continues to build. In fact, today, in revitalizing culture is strictly really about not only learning from things of historical records but learning from each other not just locally but even around the world sure. seeing cultural similarities with people in the pacific island in comparison to california there's so much similarities and commonalities and you know california indigenous cultures with hawaiians with maui and the list goes on the fact that we think that our culture is distinct because of where we exist geographically it's largely limiting and nowhere near reality. This common denominator relationship and, and, and understanding of the earth is what we all have. And some of us take on different things from there, but the main thing is, is this human culture with one common place sees in us more similarities than there ever could be differences. Well, it's interesting that if we talk about the history of sort of what I know better, which is ecology, the science of ecology, historically, the emphasis was always on predation, competition, and those are real things, and those are interesting, those are important things, but, but historically we de-emphasized more mutualism, collaboration, um, you know, like th those types of things, and there's, all, there's a bunch of theory as to why, um, but, but the fact remains that, that we've not historically explored the, the working together as much as we've yeah. explored the sort of, you know, butting heads kind of side of interactions and Yeah, in California, you know, we have over 150 distinct nations of people with different cultures, different practices, different languages. It's important to understand prior to Spanish colonization, California largely had a third of all population in North America. Yeah, it's huge. Palestine, so many people here. With over 100 distinct languages and additionally 300 dialects. I love that. Yeah, you shared that map 
with all the dialects. And even when you just look at like the Chumash region, like there's what, like over 10 different dialects there's, just within yeah. Chumash? Santa Barbara, Ventura, the Channel Islands, like, San Ynez, San Luis Obispo. Super interesting. And you know, it's important to understand linguistics. For example, we all understand Latin as the parent language of many romantic languages. Mm -hmm. As we know, French, Portuguese, Italian, Spanish, all of them come from the same family. But today, in speaking one, they're vastly different. Yes, there's some similarities, but it's important to understand that kind of linguistic comparison to many of the indigenous languages, like Chumash language, for example. Distinct languages in places like Santa Barbara differentiate widely from Ventura. Right. And there are certain words that overlap, but uniquely, they're two languages that originate from the same family, but yep. that's so powerful, unique. Totally. It wasn't uncommon for people to have the knowledge and the ability to practice multiple languages, be able to speak five or six languages fluently in trade and travel and so many other things. To think that today we're, we focus on one language that everybody learns through colonization is largely restricted because our brains are able to have the sure. capacity of expandable knowledge and in practicing that knowledge it's retained, whether it's language or interactions with plants. Yeah, and just like we have extinct or, or, or threatened or, or rare mm -hmm. plants, we have the same with languages, right? right? And so the predictions are by the end of the century, we're going to lose another, I can't remember, 7,000 or something languages across yeah. the planet Earth because of, of just the people, people going extinct, but also their culture going extinct. Even if the people might persist as entities, they, they lose that. That, that, that connect the total connection, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of that is based upon land and totally. plants and eternity totally. and environment. Totally, yeah. I mean, we're going to the Thanksgiving next week, right? Which is, which is everybody has their fall festivals all around the world, like the you know, harvest festival, end of end of food, or getting ready for winter or whatever. So those are important things to celebrate. Um, ours obviously is built around food, and a, at least the American version is built around food and celebration and coming together, but. But it's it's a it's a, a whitewashed, shall we say, version of coming together. Uh, but but it, that's that's a per, that's a classic example, right? Where where folks like needed something, they didn't know how to. If you, the old lore of the story is right, D needed something, and other folks like, damn dude, here's some corn, right? Why don't you have some corn, right? And and then the idiots couldn't plant the corn, so let, let me show you how to plant the corn, and and then um, we know what happened when you yeah. plant the corn. But, but still, at, 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 its, at its core, it's about Thanksgiving and coming together. So it should be about, right? It should be about coming together and, and, and how we build that in this crazy new world that's changing globally weirded by the day is, is challenging. And it's important to acknowledge, and, and not just acknowledge, but, but understand deeply our history, but we also need to craft new pathways. In addition to being grounded in the, in the knowledge of stuff, it, it's... It's, it's hard, and um, as we were talking before, one of the challenges our, a lot of our local tribes have is the fact that um, historically the framework for engagement has been, do you have federal status? Or are, you, are, you, are you an official Native American or are you not? Kind of thing. And, and that, that's a legacy of the missions and, and sort of deleting people and deleting clear ownership and, and association with places. But all kinds of other stuff too. But I, I think I think we're moving to a time. I hope we're moving to a time now where where that that notion of federal recognition or, or federal status or whatever the legal is is um, hopefully doesn't quite matter. It'd be interesting to see. Um, there's with, there's a unique concept that's been introduced, even at Hill by other indigenous people. It's blood quantum concept. There's yeah. only three things right. in this country that are managed such a way. Horses, dogs, and indigenous people. To be able to prove who or what you are is it's been thoroughbreds. A, it's been a legacy of you know not only ongoing colonization but directly contributing to genocide. That you know to be able to prove who you are is all these things. It's largely tied up with the political genocide that's all around us today. I would I would add in uh, slaves too. I would add in add in. Uh, we do a lot of work in Louisiana, and, and a lot of that culture is also a lot of folks are. Historically, were marginalized because of the quote-unquote amount of blood that they had that was African or or Jamaican or, or whatever the case may be. But yeah, totally, totally. Lots of divisiveness. Lots of divisive. Well, let's end on a happy note. Let's, yeah. end, let's end on a happy note. What can we? What, yeah. what, 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 what's what was the most positive thing uh, you guys saw today from our hike? 
Let's, let's, let's add something happy. What did you, what did you see? Oh, well, seeing the Dudley Elvis in its natural habitat. Dudley Elvis clinging to the cliff walls. Cool. Yeah, really nice. Yeah. Deadly of water. I mean, even though it's urban drool, it's nice to see some water in, in this late in the year when it's been a drought year, for sure. But I mean, I'm quite, I was talking about on the whole hike, like I'm, the amount of cactus scrub here is pretty incredible. I don't think I've seen that this much like dense cactus scrub in, in Ventura County before. And it's really cool to see. Yeah, that's a, a good segue because I was going to bring up the cactus too and about how you mentioned the wildflowers, how just that one plant in that community can really in, impact a lot of the other plants that are in that community by, you know, cooling down that area so that way the wildflowers are able to persist longer in that in that zone and how crucial that cactus plays a role. Yeah. Uh, I, I really do. I, I, Actually, the whole day was cool. Uh, I, I still, I still am happy. Uh, it's been so rare for the last year and a half, of just going out with people outdoors yeah. and being able to interact and talk to people uh, is um, is a huge highlight. But it, be able to do that in sort of community about talking about nature is 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 very fun, especially with with other experts that that have that, that see things the way they actually are, as opposed to sometimes we come to these places with with. Uh, some shades over our eyes and so it's it's always fun to walk around with people that uh, know more than I do and that think, think about things in similar ways and in different ways. Do you want to give a plug to all the cool stuff you're doing on Instagram? How people can connect with you? Yeah, I mean, yeah that's which, how which I, so if they want to learn more, that's what should how they I do? What should people watch you, so, yeah. How do we continue supporting your work? Yeah, how do we continue supporting your work? <laughs> <laughs> I actually, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I want, I want the work, honestly, I want the work that I dedicate myself to to be something that largely is more a part of other people's lives. People are able to take, to be able to utilize this knowledge, not take, but utilize this knowledge in ways that allow them to interact and appreciate the world in a whole new, better way. And in that, you become better advocates. Being able to continuously learn from the world around us is part of um, survival and how we've somehow forgotten how to survive in the natural world and continue to try to survive in this human created one. Leaves us isolated and feeling a variety of ways. And I want people to connect to regenerative power and that is the natural world. So the work that I do is about basically trying to educate people about that. To educate people about the power of what native plants can teach us. Plants that we so easily try to replace, kill, and even look at in complete ignorance. They have in just their silence and their existence a lot to show us. Resiliency. And in that, the capacity to exist for more than just ourselves. To be able to continuously give and benefit a world while taking only what we need. The power that comes with that. But also the ability to have the understanding of time. Where some plants only live a short amount of time, some live for thousands of years. Who are we to take away that possibility for thousands of years of continuous existence in our mere lifetimes? And to appreciate the sacredness of even a wildflower as it exists, but they continue to live for hundreds and thousands of years too. With every seed that they successfully sow, there's a connection through every generation. And so my work is to essentially tell that story through my own unique personal perspective, exposure through the professional realm of the work I've done, but also to take into this account a human culture and how that's largely ignored like the plants. We mirror one another as indigenous peoples go the human translation of this environment. Who better tells that story than the ones who actually continue to keep that culture alive in whatever shape or form. So education is number one for me. Mm -hmm various opportunities I have. I've utilized social media to my advantage. <laughs> I see it as a tool. So Instagram has been really big in like really putting out there the story of native plants, of course, showing their beauty, their integrity, and of course, representation. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I've really- So people should follow you on Instagram. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I have two, well, two of them, one private one. You get more with my private one, which is Nicholas Hummingbird. And there's another one that's more public for sharing, you know, different mm -hmm. things I manage to do from time to time. That's the uh, California native plants. And then, yeah, 
And I just hope people, whenever they embark on something, to never see native plants through being overwhelmed without going into rushing into something and then feeling at the end of the day that they may have made the wrong decision. This is a very intricate thing. It's a powerful thing. It should not be rushed. And it takes, you know, some basic understanding of what it is that needs to be done. And, you know, from there, you continue to make the right decision. And patience. Because we can, yeah, patience, because we can no longer go forward rushing into things and then trying to backtrack. We need to take the patience and the time to understand and begin to make some better choices because those choices can last hundreds if not thousands of years sometimes, good or bad. And you also have uh, people who want to get even more in depth, right? And you do some workshops and trainings and stuff? Yeah, because of COVID, you know, I lost my regular work and it's been hard trying to find new opportunities. So I've turned to utilizing Zoom for online teaching on a, a bunch of different things, specific plant environments. Mm -hmm. One popular one is how to grow plant propagation. Mm -hmm container gardening, how to like really start to begin like a native plant garden and how to take care of your plants, you know, especially in seasons and mm -hmm. all that has been making a lot of knowledge and a lot of this, you know, more accessible for folks. And it has made sure. huge differences. In fact, I've seen advocacy more than ever for native plants with just getting people more involved and mm -hmm. having them mm -hmm. in these spaces where they can learn and ask questions without being bankrupted. <laughs> Awesome. So we'll have all those links somewhere yeah. in the lots of cool thing. workshops. He also sells seeds parts of the year too, so you can you can you buy can seeds. Buy yeah. seeds. There you go. He has all kinds of cool. Uh, I'm totally selling you right now because <laughs> I've I've learned a ton from you over the past couple of years with native plants and just like you know we were talking on the way down just or in on on Tuesday how a lot of folks like try to avoid planting during the summer because they think they're going to everything. But he has a method that he's used and I, I tried out and like I planted probably 20, 30 plants in the middle of the summer and they've all done really successful just by giving it a little bit more care and, and doing things a certain way, setting them, up, setting them up for success. And you know the way that you kind of burn your grasses to rejuvenate them, stuff like that, like there's a lot of good information on his on the page. So cool. yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, thanks. That was great. That was Thank great. You. All right. Woohoo!